So believe it or not, I actually have rules for this series. Number one is I don't cover the back of grid teams from the 1980s if the video can just be summed up in underfunded and slow. Number two is I don't really cover stories from Formula One post sort of 2010 unless they're properly interesting. And today is a day where I break that second rule because it was something that got talked about a lot at the time but then sort of got swept under the rug at the end of the 2019 season and into the start of the 2020 season. And if you know me, you'll know that I love discussing these kinds of stories, you know, the controversies, the cheating scandals, that kind of thing, because they always boil down to the nitty gritty levels of engineering. And I just find that really, really interesting, even if most of the technical stuff is beyond this smooth brain. So with that said, today we'll be looking at the controversial Ferrari engines from 2019. Well, actually, Hold that thought for a second. And the reason I say this is because this controversy didn't really start in 2019. It kind of started in 2017, you know, when the Chonk Boy regulations came into Formula One. We had the cars that ran from 2014 to 2016, which was sort of an evolution of the ones before in 2013. But, you know, the hybrid engines had kicked in. And then the FIA decided after just three seasons, we're going to change the rules completely. We're going to have more aggressive, bigger, you know, cooler looking F1 cars that are more aesthetically pleasing to look at on telly and to also rein in Mercedes a bit by resetting the rules for everybody. Yes, they did actually change the rules to stop Mercedes while well, they have tried to change the rules to stop Mercedes, I should say. So now Mercedes actually had some competition. The prancing horses from Maranello. Ferrari. So Ferrari took the fight to Mercedes with the SF70H, a car that differed slightly from the Mercedes in that it was a tad shorter and would therefore be more nimble in slower corners. And Vettel won the first round of the 2017 championship, and then Hamilton took the spoils in China, Vettel would win in Bahrain, and then Merck and Ferrari would trade blows right up until that chaotic race in Baku, when Vettel pulled alongside and drove into the side of Hamilton's Mercedes because he felt he'd been brake tested under the safety car. He didn't get brake tested, I don't know why we're still discussing this. Although, while Vettel did get a penalty, Hamilton also had to pit because his headrest had come loose, so both of them got messed around. But after the Hungarian Grand Prix, Hamilton won three in a row, the third of those being the start of Ferrari's Asian implosion, when a start line collision wiped out Vettel and Raikkonen plus Verstappen and Alonso, and there were also problems in Malaysia and problems in Japan that basically handed Hamilton his fourth world title. So while there were no suspicions raised at this point, we know that now Ferrari and Vettel were a legitimate threat to Mercedes. So moving on into 2018, the fight for five. Hamilton, Vettel, four world titles. Whoever won this season would join the immortals of Fangio and Schumacher with five or more. Vettel started 18 like he did in 17, winning the Australian Grand Prix and won again in Bahrain. Hamilton didn't win until Baku, but he also took the win at Barcelona. Ricardo won the Monaco Grand Prix with gearbox issues, and then in Canada, Vettel took another win to close the gap on Hamilton, who had gone into that race 14 points ahead. But at the Canadian Grand Prix at Montreal in 2018, Ferrari brought an engine upgrade that just had everybody stumped. Because at some point down the back straight, you know, between the hairpin and that final chicane, the Ferrari was getting this just weird boost in power at around the 120 130 mile an hour mark as if it was you know engaging some sort of need for speed style nitrous boost and it was clearly visible on camera it would just go whoop, like that i don't know why i described it in that way but screw it let's carry on Overnight, by F1 standards, Ferrari had found something in the region of 38 horsepower, and many in the paddock said that this was something in the region of two years development within the space of a few months. But there was already discussions going on in the background. Mercedes and Red Bull via Renault had asked for clarification on Ferrari's twin battery setup, which the FIA said was totally legal so long as the combined output of both batteries were the correct amount of fully legal MGUK deployment, which was 128 kilowatts or 160 horsepower. But Mercedes and Renault were still not happy that Ferrari had managed to gain such a boost in power to not just get level with the performance of the Mercedes engines, but surpass them. 
And it wasn't just at Canada, because at the other sort of power tracks, so Austria, Silverstone, Hockenheim, Spa and Monza, the Ferraris just had this straight line advantage over everybody else. And Mercedes and Renault could not figure out how they were able to gain so much power overnight. In Formula One terms, that is, you know, having an engine capable of outrunning the Enterprise E. But Ferrari couldn't turn this power into winning form. While Vettel did win the British Grand Prix after Raikkonen tipped Hamilton round accidentally at like turn three or wherever it was, Verstappen won in Austria, Hamilton won in Germany after Vettel slid off the road in a bit of light drizzle, and Hamilton won again in Hungary, although Hungary isn't exactly a power track. Despite this newfound engine power, Vettel was only able to win in Belgium. Then there was the Italian Grand Prix where Vettel spun jostling with Hamilton at the second chicane, all the while being a bit miffed that Kimi had been given the toe in qualifying. But then in Singapore, and for the rest of the season, that warp speed coming out of the corners vanished. So that twin battery I was telling you about before, well this is the theory behind what Ferrari was doing, so like I said they had two batteries, each one producing 60 kilowatts to produce the maximum legal amount of power available. The FIA only had one sensor for the two batteries, so one battery was producing 60 kilowatts, the FIA assumed that the other one would also be producing 60 kilowatts. Mercedes and Red Bull as well as Renault were claiming that the other battery that didn't have the sensor on was chucking out a little bit more power than would otherwise be allowed. 70 kilowatts, 80 kilowatts, however much, which is not allowed. And this is where the second sensor to kill Ferrari thing came from. It's said that this sensor was on the car as early as Monaco, but the late Charlie Whiting denied that any such thing had ever been fitted, you know, post-Monaco, before Monaco, at any point during the 2018 season, despite the stories flooding the internet from the various, you know, motorsport outlets, you know, claiming that Whiting had fitted this sensor to the Ferrari per the FIA's instructions. But it was clear to see, the boost seen at places like Canada, Monza, Silverstone and so on, as evidenced by GPS data, had disappeared, but at the same time, there are some other factors we have to include here. Number one, engine life as a whole. It was coming to the end of the season. Ferrari had to preserve what they had to avoid penalties, something Mercedes didn't have to worry about in the latter part of the 2021 season, and I know that that's going to come up in the comments. And the reason why Mercedes was able to do that kind of thing is because that engine was only designed to run for the Brazilian, Qatar, Saudi and Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, instead of the seven it should normally run for, well, five or six as it was at that point. Number two, Ferrari had to run more rear wing in Sochi to save its rear tyres. Number three, Singapore didn't really need that boost. And number four, the Mercedes had maybe found a way to extract more power themselves, which made the Ferraris appear slower. But since Mercedes won that year, the claims of dodgy engines went away, at least for a bit anyway. You know, such is the case with anything in Formula One, people will keep an eye on things that other teams are doing, and as soon as it starts affecting my results, then I'm going to start protesting it. You know, like the Michelin tyres that I covered a couple of weeks ago, or whenever it was, you know, with 2003, and, you know, that thing. I did that. So moving on into 2019, Ferrari is still near the top of the pecking order and now they had up and coming talent Charles Leclerc on board as Raikkonen had gone back to Sauber. Leclerc could have taken a win in Bahrain but an engine problem handed Hamilton a win that he was not really in contention for given the pace of that Ferrari in the desert and Vettel had his win taken away in Canada after he was judged to have unsafely rejoined after cutting the turn 3-4 chicane. It's a win that some people are still salty about even to this day, but the fact remains at least on some level Vettel choked with a silver car in his rearview mirror, and not for the first time at Canada either. But I made enough videos on that kind of thing at that time, so let's just, let's just move on. Mercedes won the opening 8 Grand Prix of the 2019 season, but Vettel did put in a superb drive at Hockenheim which was, let's be honest, a carnage fest to finish second. But then in Belgium, Ferrari gained a lot of pace, again seemingly overnight as they came back from the summer break with a car that had woken up. While the previous upgrades had given them around 38 horsepower in 2018 to leapfrog the Mercedes cars, this time it was estimated to be 50 horsepower. 25 to catch Mercedes and then 25 more to surpass Mercedes, resulting in Mercedes, Renault and Honda questioning the legality of these engines, with the twin battery hack rumours doing the rounds online again. 
Red Bull had already submitted some questions to the FIA prior to the Belgian Grand Prix, which Leclerc won and then went on to win at the Italian Grand Prix at Monza as well. And according to the race, at the Belgian Grand Prix, Ferrari had something of over a second compared to Mercedes in straight line pace. So the run between La Source and Le Com, and also the run from Stavolo up to the bus stop. But because the Mercedes was pretty good in the twisty bit, they were able to claw back about half of that time. And while the Ferrari was indeed monstrous at Spa, the Mercs were closer at Monza due to the way the Mercedes needed to be set up. And because everybody else was trimmed out and at full chat for longer, there wasn't as much emphasis on acceleration there compared to Spa. And given that there were theories of cheating the fuel flow, maybe Ferrari didn't run the engine so hot to make sure that they actually made it to the end at that particular track. Because Ferrari winning at Monza is good for business. Then at the United States Grand Prix, the power mysteriously disappeared again, leading Max Verstappen to say that's what happens when you stop cheating. It's thought that Ferrari was exploiting a hole in how these sensors work. And, you know, these sensors don't work constantly. They work on second pulses, five second pulses, ten second pulses, however long it's measured. And it's believed that Ferrari had figured out the timing of these sensors and then had programmed their onboard computers to fire more fuel through the engine when the sensor wasn't taking readings. When the technical directive at the US Grand Prix was issued saying that any attempt to circumvent the sensors is strictly prohibited, the performance just went, and it was quite suspicious. Then at the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, Leclerc was found to be underfueled. By that, what I mean is, before the race, you have to declare how much fuel you're putting in the car. This then led to more assumptions and allegations that Ferrari had not properly calibrated its fueling systems to show that it had put in 110 kilos of fuel as an example, when in reality they had put in more so that they could burn it at somewhere like Spa or Monza, or put in less so it was lighter and a little quicker after the technical directive was issued. And one thing to remember here is the Ferraris were based off a high drag concept so they needed as much power as possible to offset it. And since the car between 17 and 21 was based off the power they had, rather than what they ended up with after Singapore 18 and USA 19, it answers why they've been so bad lately. You know, maybe in 2022 they'll be fighting for wins again. And we still don't know the answers to this day, as in the early weeks of 2020, Ferrari and the FIA entered a confidential agreement regarding Ferrari's engines used in the 2019 season, which many assumed to be we won't do anything unless you tell us what you did so we can stop other people doing it. It's a debate that rages on, and since cheating in motorsport involves some trickery and engineering level most of the time, it's pretty interesting. You know, option 13, the Toyota Celica restrictor plate, you know, all of that stuff really interesting to dive into. But I'd like to know what you think, even though this isn't really an opinion video. And if you are heading down to comment, make sure you like the video if you haven't already. And if you're not already, get subscribed and also get that bell on so you never miss out on a future video. There is also a massive thanks to the patrons of this channel. And if you want to help support me at a more personal level to make sure I can get the production levels up as high as possible, as well as other stuff, links will be in the description to Patreon, Discord, and also my socials. So until next time, I've been Ada Mild. Have a great day, Rave Live in the World, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. So until then, goodbye.